Hi, this is Beatrice Leonard right here on the move with Travis with Disabilities Having Fun. And we're going to stay in our fantasy today, especially us females. And, and we all the time want to have a good man, a good sounding man, a man that's going to tell us the truth or a man that's going to lie to us with a good voice. And I want to thank Eric Jerome Dickey for being with us today. How you doing? Oh, same old, same old, man. I'm just finishing up Resurrected Midnight and it's about to come out. So it's a lot of uh, high stakes, a lot, a lot of energy, a right. lot of greed. You have a lot of people who are basically soldiers in someone else's wars. So it's a, it's a lot of action, a lot of action, a lot of drama, and just everything that you expect from a novel involving Gideon. Because Gideon is a particular type of character. He's he a is he lives in his He lives in this other world that operates outside of the law. Yes. And, and there's professional assignments and there are mm-hmm. personal stuff that Gideon uh, has to deal with. The stuff that I raised way back in Sleeping with Strangers, which was the first Gideon novel that, right. that moved through Waking with Enemies and was again brought up in uh, Dying for Revenge that get answered in Resurrected Midnight. And because that's the way I write it. I mean, I write it where I don't answer everything now. But I know the characters are ongoing, you know. And as, and as stuff gets answered, more issues are raised. But sometimes by answering a question, it leads to more questions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Your books are always such a treat to us for us who are blind or visually impaired because we get talking books from the Library of Congress. Okay. So when they're on top of things, we can get one of your books. I have to be honest with you, sometimes it takes us eight months to a year to get one of your books recorded. But if, okay. we're, if we're not able to get it from the library with the audio books, and right, so we're right. able to get audio books. So anytime we're able to get one of your books, it's just like Christmas. When one of your books comes out and we cannot wait, We'll get a sighted person and we'll meet over each other's house and order some pizza of popcorn and, we, and they read the book to us. That's interesting. I know just for me, I, I do a few readings at the book signings. Mm-hmm. And even when I'm reading, my voice isn't Gideon's voice. Mm-hmm. I know people probably think it is, but when I'm imagining Gideon or Constantine or Alvin or any other other characters in the book, it's not my voice. Mm-hmm. It changes. Uh, well, no, no, it's just it's just like your imagination. Like you imagine this is how your she would character exactly. sound. Because Gideon is a character who's like this. If he's around someone American, they ask him, what country is he from? So he doesn't sound like he's from America. Mm-hmm. If he's in London, they ask him, what country are you from? Well, you don't sound like, you don't sound, you know what I mean? So he yeah, has he this changes. sort of, well, he, he's, a, he's international. He's right. traveled the world. Changes, I mean, right. I, when you travel and you are familiar with so many accents and dialects, when you do speak in that language, you sound like you're from that country. Absolutely. Right. So like in this novel, most of it, a lot of it takes place in Argentina. Argentine Spanish sounds very Italian. Mm. So it would be such that if Gideon was in Argentina and he started speaking, so on in Argentina, would think, oh, you're from, you're from here, but he's not. Mm-hmm. And that's part of the thing about what enables him to do what he does is that he can blend in and he's invisible. Because I remember in um, Sleeping with Strangers, someone came up to him at the airport when he first landed in London. They were speaking to him in Dutch, and he spoke back to them in Dutch. It's not just Arizona Hawks or anyone else. When I'm writing, it's everyone. It's the scenes of Constantine. He's extremely Russian, mm-hmm. and the scene with him and the things he's doing and he's talking about and the way he's talking is extremely Russian. Okay. All the boys who are under 10 capturing their language and their past, one of being of German ancestry and the other being of African ancestry. And, mm-hmm. and all of these people are in this novel together. Catherine is French. Arizona is mm-hmm. Filipina. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hawks is from Philadelphia, but she grew up down south. Sierra has been in three books, and she's Arizona's sister. She's been a crucial part of three books, but right. yet we don't know anything about her. In your book, Chasing Destiny... Looking at uh, Destiny, a young woman, 15, going through her changes. I guess with my background being in social work, when I read your books, you get so involved with the psychological things going on. Do you use a psychologist or someone for background? Because, I mean, Eric, you're just so on it. And sometimes when someone just first meet your books, they're saying, like, you know, God, is this guy on? I mean, what's, what's up with this? Because they're so deep. That particular story, Chasing Destiny, it went through a lot of rewrites. I mean, the character Destiny used to be a kid named Melanie who had a great relationship with her mother. And before Billy, who worked as a bartender, her name was Nina, and she was a nurse, and she owned a home. 
So part of the creative process is modifying and changing the characters until they fit what you're trying to do in the story, that, the characters that make the story work. Mm -hmm. uh, initially, Billy drove a car, and then I took off the car and put on a motorcycle. The yellow one. And not just a motorcycle. I just didn't say motorcycle. I found the Italian Ducati, which is a rarity in itself. You know, everyone doesn't drive a Ducati. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't a Honda. It wasn't a Yamaha. It was, uh, you know, it was a it's not one of those bikes that you trick out and put all this other extra stuff on it. When you roll the Ducati off the lot, that's it. That's all she wrote. <laughs> that's all she wrote. You don't, you don't need to do anything to a Ducati, you know. Right, it's there. And, and researching the life of someone who rides a motorcycle. I actually took classes, learned how to ride a motorcycle. So in the scenes where she's on the motorcycle, I know exactly what she's doing. Mm -hmm. I know exactly how it feels. I know how she should ride the bike. Mm -hmm. So at the same time, so I'm riding her and the guy, I forgot the guy, not Keith, but the other guy who was learning how to ride the motorcycle. You know, I'm riding him being clumsy on a motorcycle mm -hmm. and her being smooth on a motorcycle in the same scenes. Mm -hmm. And I take that and I'm riding that. And in the middle of that, I have them having their personal conversation. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's a, it's a lot. I mean, it's for Gideon, I, I go to London, I go to Argentina, I go to Antigua. I go to Amsterdam so I can write these scenes, so I can write them properly. It's like if I write a scene that takes place in uh, Antigua. Okay, and that's a beautiful it, country. I've been there. Thank you. And I write it so that if people in Antigua read the book and they're reading about their island, it's on point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because I've read books where, say, years ago, I read a book where a writer was writing something that took place in D.C., and then it moved to California, to L.A., and I live in L.A., Mm -hmm. And it was all wrong. I was like, no. It, I mean, they actually had characters turning on streets that run parallel to each other. Mm -hmm. The wrong flow of traffic during a particular time of day. So like in uh, Sleep More Strangers Waking with Enemies, I, when I was in London, I would intentionally get on the subway different times of day just to see what the flow was like. Mm -hmm. You know, what kind of madness does it have in the morning? What time does it slow down? What is it like in the evening? Mm -hmm. And what is it like when the subway is closed down? I mean, so I do a lot of, um, I guess, research, if you will. Your characters are so colorful. How do you keep your dialects so separated that they do not flow into your other books and they're always so fresh that when someone picks up an Eric Jerome Dickey book, it's not a book, oh, God, it's just like the book he wrote last time. <laughs> they're always so fresh and, and keeping your dialogue so fresh. Yeah, I think part of it is uh, I read a variety of genres. A book like Friends and Lovers is not like Drive Me Crazy, is not like John Viev, is not like the Gideon series. Oh, well, she was something that John yeah, Viev, well, woo! Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would, I would, for me, if I had my brothers, I'd put them all in different genres, huh? mm -hmm. and not just thrown on the same table with everybody else's stuff, but it is what it is. And I think part of it is really is when I'm sitting down to, to write a particular story, is like kind of understanding the genre that I'm writing in at the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I know what type of story I want this to be. And every story that I write, for me as a writer, it has its own rules, like um, Sister, Sister. Oh, that was good with those two, Sister Thanks. Red and Black, and then they brought another person. That was a good one. Yeah, I mean, so like a sister, sister early on, it's like they, stuff can get to a certain point, but there will be no bloodshed. There can be threats, there can be this, mm -hmm. we can rip stuff off walls, but there's not going to be any physical violence between whatever. And, and between lovers, there was a competition for... The, the two women sense. for that guy. Yeah, yes. right, but the guy and the girl who basically were in love with the same woman, they were not going to get into a physical fight. And they so, didn't. You played that all so tastefully, especially when they were there in the restaurant, and she was, I can't think of her name, she was sitting back observing her uh, lover. Ayana, and, Ayana, Ayana, yeah. Ayana. But they, they had intellectual battles. I mean, mm -hmm. for, it was the, uh, I'm smarter than you, I'm richer than you, I'm, therefore I'm better than you. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, they were equal. Well, Eric Jerome Dickey, I want to thank you so much for being with us today. Okay, thank you. I'll see you real soon, and for everyone to have a marvelous and fantastic travel experience.